Hi, I'm Lou, and uh, I wanted to share my journey with Jesus with you. I was living in Warren, it was after school, and I was living in Warren at the time, and uh, one weekend I ran into an old friend, and he used to party with me, and um, he was totally different, and he told me about Jesus and how Jesus had changed his life. And uh, I'll tell you, I was just at a point in my life where that was like a breath of fresh air, and I knew that I, I wanted Jesus. And so I prayed with him and um, asked Jesus to forgive my sins and to come into my life, and I felt such joy uh, just enter in. Fast forward a few years, I met Tom McGill, and I made the second best decision of my life when I said yes to Tom. Uh, he's, he's a great man, we won't go into all that. I was praying about, I had a burden for women of various churches, and I wanted to have something where women would come together uh, more in a, a friendship evangelism setting and just share. And so as I was praying, I um, came upon a scripture. And it was really cool because it was in the Message Bible. And it was just that modern day. It was just like Jesus, Jesus and I sitting there. And all of a sudden, Jesus said, so here's what I want you to do. When you gather for worship, each one of you be prepared with something that will be useful for all. Sing a hymn, teach a lesson, tell a story, lead a prayer, provide an insight. Uh, and then it skips down and no more than two or three speakers at a meeting. With the rest of you listening and taking it to heart, take your turn, no one person taking over. Then each speaker gets a chance to say something special from God and you all learn from each other. When you choose to speak, you're also responsible for how and when you speak. When we worship the right way, God doesn't stir us up into confusion. He brings us into harmony. And that's um, out of 1 Corinthians 14, 26 on. Um, so at that point in time, I had my answer and I knew that Jesus was asking me to just walk the scripture out. So basically the living room was born and um, ladies started coming together from different churches and immediately they started just signing up on my little calendar to take their turn. I put out coffee and tea, it happens weekly, and that's been happening for the last 15 years. So that's my origin story. out of 1 Corinthians 14, 26 on. Um, so at that point in time, I had my answer and I knew that Jesus was asking me to just walk the scripture out. So basically the living room was born and um, ladies started coming together from different churches and immediately they started just signing up on my little calendar to take their turn. I put out coffee and tea, it happens weekly, and that's been happening for the last 15 years. So that's my origin story. Yeah, that's worth clapping for. It's really special to uh, to take somebody that I really love and respect and admire and hear how they got to be where they are. That's a really cool thing. So, one day, Jesus stood before his disciples and told them that they were only at the beginning of the story. They'd been traveling around with him for three years, and uh, things had been really really good, like not perfect. They had their rough spots. Uh, they'd spent nights on the road. They'd been uh, verbally attacked by priests, teachers of the law. They faced huge crowds. Uh, so there'd been excitement. There'd been scary days. There'd been scary days on boats, 
uh, scary days facing down the crowds. There's been, there'd been so much. Um, but but none, of them, none of it really fazed them too much uh, because, well, there'd been so much amazing stuff happen too. Uh, when there were scary days on boats, there was Jesus walking on water. Where there were unruly crowds, there was uh, bread multiplying and overflowing baskets. Uh, when there were attacks by, by priests and teachers, religious leaders, there was Jesus answering the questions, answering the tax, and asking his own questions. And so uh, things hadn't all been easy, but they had Jesus, and they had each other, and things were great, and they were in the middle of something amazing that God was doing. Except that one day, Jesus told them they weren't in the middle of something that God was doing. They had barely gotten started, and things were going to change. They'd barely gotten started. Things were going to get, well, things were going to get harder. Uh, things were going to get worse. And all of the teaching, all of the miracles, the mystery, uh, those things were all just the front door to the journey that they were going on in following Jesus. Uh, Katie, you want to bring up our scripture passage? Let me read to you from Matthew chapter 16. Uh, These will be verses 21 through 27. This is Matthew 16, verses 21 through 27. And it says, uh, from that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed, and on the third day, raised to life. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said, this shall never happen to you. And Jesus turned to Peter and said to him, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. And then Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny himself and then take up the cross and follow me. Whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? For the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels, and then he will reward each person according to what they have done. Pray with me. Our Father, Uh, We come before you this morning uh, to set our minds on the concerns of the kingdom. We want to hear from you. We want to meet you in this place. Uh, We want to see what you're doing, and we want to join you in it. We want to understand our place in the story. And so, uh, as you fill my mouth with words, I pray that uh, you would speak to us, your people, that we would hear from you and know your heart for us. In your son's name I pray. Amen. Your life changes direction when you decide to follow Jesus. Like, your life changes direction when you decide to follow Jesus because the way that he is going isn't the way that you were going when you first met him. Like, that's the story that you just heard Lou tell. That's the story you heard Keith Fry tell last week. Uh, Your life changes direction when you decide to follow Jesus because the way you were going before you met him uh, isn't the way that he was going. That's true of you. That was true of Jesus' disciples. Uh, Even after they'd spent years traveling around with him and hearing him teach, waiting, uh, watching him, watching him change the world around him. But when he sat down and told his disciples where he was going, uh, Peter... He told them where he was going, and Peter pulled him aside. 
and said, never. He said, this can't happen to you. Because where Jesus was going was, was death. Jesus was going to be killed, to suffer and be killed. And his disciples couldn't stomach that. And you, you can imagine why, right? Jesus was 100% of what held them together. With Jesus, the attacks, they felt okay. Uh, because, well, Jesus took care of the attacks. With Jesus, the storms were, were settled. With Jesus, the crowds were healed and fed. And so Peter reacted so vehemently to the idea that Jesus would be killed uh, because even now, he refused to accept a reality that didn't have Jesus in it. He couldn't, he couldn't fathom of a reality that didn't have Jesus in it. And so he said, this can't happen to you. And I think that's kind of beautiful, actually. Um, I want that for you. I want that for us. I want us to experience a life uh, so filled with Jesus that we really can't accept the idea of life without him. Like, I want you to know deep down that when you're in the boat looking out over stormy seas, rocking and afraid, that the man walking across the waves is a friend, that you can walk out to meet him, and that when you start to sink, he'll clasp onto your arm. I want you to know what it is to rest in his arms, even when life is tumultuous. But I want more than that for you, too. God wants more than that for you, and he wants more than that from you. Uh, that's only a piece of what he has to offer. Uh, the heart of what God has to offer you is this invitation, uh, follow me. Follow me. I'm going to die, to suffer and die. Follow me. There's a cross at the end of my journey and I myself will carry it and die on it. Follow me. And I will move through death into a life like you've never imagined. Follow me. That's the text. That's the story that we're in. There's always death in the middle of the story that we're in. Which brings me back to what I've said before. Jesus is laying out an invitation to follow him and he's going in a different direction than you're going on your own. Not death. We're all headed towards death. That's not a new direction. Uh, we're headed towards death either way. But, but don't get caught in the same place Peter did. You see, Peter got caught up on the idea that Jesus was going to die. He said this can never happen to you because he couldn't imagine death happening to Jesus. But, but death is the middle of the story. Death is the middle of the story. Death uh, isn't where Jesus is going. It's just how he's getting there. He is going to die, suffering at the hands of the people who should be friends, who should be serving him, who should love him. Uh, he is going to die. But where Jesus is going uh, in the Gospels, this isn't death, but life. And life isn't where you're headed on your own. You were headed... To, to a death where your life was taken from you. There are a lot of roads to death where your life is taken from you. So many paths, but they all end up in that same place. You were following after money? Well, whatever it gives you, it will cost you your life. You were following after something, and the things that you were following after uh, were killing you just as surely as a cross will. I don't, I don't want to make the invitation that Jesus offers us less than it is. Um, on one hand, I don't want to make it less scary than it is. Like, this is an intense request. He's not simply asking you to follow him and do good where you can, uh, although he does ask that. Uh, he isn't asking you to follow him and, and share the good news with everybody that uh, you meet. That isn't, that, isn't the, that isn't the invitation here, although he does ask that. Um, all of that follows, but it starts with pick up your cross. It starts with the cross, and the cross is not referring to your hardships 
although there are plenty of those. It's not referring to uh, your addiction or your sin. Um, It's not referring to whatever hard things come your way, whatever bad things happen in life. Um, It's what you're carrying for Jesus. The cross is a very specific hardship. Uh, It's only good for one thing, death. And it represents your death. It represents something is essential inside of you, shifting, changing direction, going a different way. Uh, The heart of taking up your cross is denying yourself and choosing him instead. Uh, And that means, well, that means uh, denying that you are the one true king of your universe. Taking up your cross, following Jesus, that means denying that you're in charge, denying that you are the ultimate ruler of your life. Uh, Notice that uh, this passage uh, comes directly after another really important story. So uh, Matthew 16, 21 says, from that time on, Jesus started telling his disciples that he was going to die. So what represents that shift? Uh, What time on uh, are we talking about? Well, just a few moments ago in this story, uh, Jesus asked his disciples a question. Uh, his disciples, who been at, have, have been following him for like three years now, he asks them, who do people say that I am? And they come up with some creative answers. They come up with all sorts of answers. Uh, and this would happen if you asked people that question too. Who do people say that Jesus is? You'd get some creative answers. And then Jesus asked them, well, forget everyone else. Who do you say that I am? Who do you say that I am? And Peter, uh, the same one to whom Jesus says, get behind me, Satan, a few verses later, says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. You are the Christ. Um, You've... Uh, heard from us, if you've been here uh, much at all, a million times, talk about what this language of Christ means, because it's really huge. Uh, It isn't just a cute nickname for Jesus. It's not his last name. Uh, It's something really critical. It's uh, it's a royal title, is what it is. Uh, It signifies that Jesus is the one true king of the world. And Peter says, I know who you are. You are the one true king of the world. You're the one we've been waiting for. You're the one we've been looking for. You are the one true king. Uh, Friends, you can hang around Jesus for a long time, uh, but when you recognize him as as the one true king, that's when things shift and there's an invitation on the table, an invitation to come and die, to allow yourself to be deposed, to allow yourself to be dethroned in your own life, that you may save it. Uh, Death, uh, giving up control over your own life, that's a scary thing. But, uh, you know, it's a scary thing, but it isn't a costly thing. The heart of this passage, denying yourself following Jesus, I don't want to present it as the hardest decision that you'll ever make. I I think that when you see Jesus on his throne... When you see Jesus as the one true king and you see the kingdom that he's bringing into this, into this world, I think it's the only decision that you can make. Um, I think that when you understand what it means for Jesus to be on his throne, uh, you come running to that decision. I think that when you find the cross, uh, it, you find then that the cross is not a thing to be feared, uh, not when you're following Jesus with it. Uh, you see, it's, it's kind of like this. It's kind of like a man who finds a treasure hidden in a field. And once he found that treasure, he ran off and sold everything that he owned to buy that field. Because what he found in that field was infinitely more valuable than anything else. It's like a merchant who's on the hunt for great pearls. And one day he found the largest and most beautiful pearl that he'd ever seen. And when he did, he went and sold everything else that he had. He had no need of it anymore because he found the thing that he was looking for. This is a hard decision, not a costly decision, because when you find that thing that you're looking for, uh, you're ready to let go of everything else. Uh, 
when you find what you're looking for, everything that you have becomes easier to let go of. When you know that the thing that you have, the thing that you want is more, worth more than all the stuff that you have, it becomes easier to let go of what you have. One thing that I think is really cool about this is that um, even though the moment when you come to follow Jesus represents a shift in your relationship with Jesus, uh, and it can, I, even though that moment when you start following him, when you say, you know, you are my one true king, uh, like you could, spend, you could spend years hanging around in his circles before you actually decide that you want to acknowledge him as king. Um, the, this invitation to come take up the cross and follow him, that, that comes years into Jesus' disciples' relationship with him. Um, but uh, that doesn't take away the value of everything else that they've experienced in their life and in that time leading up to that moment. Uh, it doesn't devalue that. Uh, and that's true of every single person that comes to follow Jesus, even though that's an origin story, even though that moment when, you're follow, when you start following Jesus uh, is an origin um, it doesn't uh, discount all of the stuff that happens before that. Actually, it, it, it redeems all of that stuff. It gives all of that stuff more value. Uh, all, all those years, uh, the disciples saw Jesus feeding people and healing people and teaching the good news. And those were moments where they learned what it looks like for Jesus to be king. Those were moments where they started to learn what it looked like for Jesus to be the Christ, for Jesus to be on, their thro on his throne. And so Jesus showed, showed them like, what his kingdom means. In my kingdom, no one goes hungry. In my kingdom, no one's fatherless. In my kingdom, no one is sick. In my kingdom, death is abolished, ultimately. No one can stay dead in my kingdom because I am life. And not like a life that you've experienced before. More than that. The life that you've experienced before is just a, a pale imitation compared to what I have to offer you. It's more. And so... Drink from me, and you'll never be thirsty again. Uh, friends, whatever it is that you think you can do for yourself, it's a pale comparison to what God can do for you. Uh, for instance, if uh, you need to work harder to make more money, to have more security, like, okay, sure, pay the bills. That matters. I get that. And... Uh, truly, Jesus has security for you. He has a home for you that you won't need to pay a mortgage on. Uh, and he's there even now getting it ready for you. Uh, Jesus will have food on the table. Even if we can only be sure of this table and that last table, like we will eat. But, of course, it isn't as simple as that. Because like, you need to eat now, too. But Jesus cares about now, too. Because his kingdom is at hand even now. Uh, you are sojourners and exiles in this place, in a land that is not your own. You're living as foreigners in a country that doesn't hold your citizenship. But that doesn't mean that we just wait until we get back home. It means we invest in the land we're in. We buy homes and live in them. We grow food and eat it, and we marry and have children. But we also maintain the customs of our homeland. The customs of the kingdom say this. It's, they say, you know, work hard and pay your bills. Enjoy your things. But recognize that your finances are under my rule and not yours. And so trust me when things don't meet up the way that you want them to. And above all, don't sacrifice things that are mine to money. Like that's the custom of the kingdom. The custom of the, king, custom of the kingdom is recognizing the role of God even as we sojourn in this foreign land. Don't lay your family down on the altar of money. Uh, don't 
uh, you, you put your money on the altar of pleasure. Don't put your advancement over your ethics. And that's just one example. But this is what it means to live in this world, even as we're foreigners here. It means uh, that, above all, we bow to the rule of God. And the rule of God wants us to work on be the behalf of this city. It wants us to work on behalf of the country that we're in, even as the kingdom of God is coming to this place, even as we bring the kingdom to this place. Uh, he cares about now, uh, but don't sacrifice the future over now. Uh, don't lay your soul down on the altar of this world, because... Um, you don't want to be in the boat where you're gaining the whole world and losing your soul because that's, the soul's the more valuable thing and much better to let go of everything else. Uh, the role of Christ reorders things. Sometimes it affirms the significance of things uh, while, they're, while denying their ultimate significance. It says, yeah, that is important, but it's not the most important thing. And ultimately, that's how it is with you taking up the cross, laying your life down, denying yourself, that does not deny your significance. It does deny that you are the only or the ultimately significant thing in the universe. It reorders you. That's the invitation. Jesus says, this is how I did it. I was seated at the right hand of God the Father. I had everything. I had everything except you, and you were the thing I wanted. And so I set that all aside. I, all of the throne room of heaven, I set that all aside. I denied myself. I gave up my life because your life was more important to me. Go and do likewise. You're not in so high a place as Jesus, but you can trust that he's taking care of your life. So... You can let it go. You can let it go. Jesus trusted that the Father was taking care of his life so he could let it go. And so the same way, as you are loving yourself, go and love other people instead because you can trust Jesus.